Okay, welcome back. So we're going to continue here with chapter three uh, in industrial organization, which is all about game theory, it's introduction to game theory. And last time we talked about players and strategies and information. Here we're going to focus on how to find the Nash equilibrium a little more explicitly. So I did talk about that a little bit in the last video. We'll try to do that a little bit more uh, explicitly here. Um, okay, so one thing that we did talk about a little bit, especially in relation to uh, the prisoner's dilemma, is this idea of dominant strategies. And basically, dominant strategies are ones where it's always better to do that strategy than anything else. And that makes finding the Nash equilibrium really easy, right? So we can sort of think of two sides of the same coin here. One is a strategy that is uh, strictly dominated. So in this case, they're saying, okay, imagine that S and S prime are feasible strategies. If F prime is always worse than something else, right? So it's like the worst possible strategy, then you can cross it out, right? It's strictly dominated. You don't need to worry about it. Um, and if S is a dominant strategy, then you know that it's always going to be chosen by that player. And so you can cross everything else out. And so sometimes you can find, you know, in the prisoner's dilemma, you can just find the dominant strategies. It's always confess, confess. That's super easy. Sometimes you can find the Nash equilibrium by crossing out dominated strategies, right? So if, okay, this strategy is dominated, we can cross that one out, and then we can look at the other options for the other player and say, oh, okay, this strategy is dominated, we can cross that one out and keep going back and forth until you're left with your uh, equilibrium. Um, and so that would be a, a dominant strategy equilibrium, and there are some games like that, like The Prisoner's Dilemma, um, but there are a lot of games that are, you can't use that strategy to find. Right. And we talked about, you know, finding that Nash equilibrium. Um, and so we're going to go through that. It's actually very simple to find what we'll call the pure strategy Nash equilibrium uh, of a uh, simultaneous uh, game. So let's think about, um, you know, how we want to do this. Right. So here we have an example of a game. I, I hope I, I don't know if this was actually done. Kind of hope not, maybe. Um, so <laughs> at one end of the pen was a button that when pushed dispends food in a trough at the other end of the pen. Um, and so you can either push the button, these are for pigs, um, or not push the button um, and wait for the trough for the food to be dispensed. Uh, so here we have our two players, our big pig and our small pig. Um, and we can think about, okay, well, how... What does this mean again? So let's just remember, big pig is our row player. That's player one. So big pig's payoffs are going to be first. And small pig is player two. And so small pig's payoffs are going to be second. So if they both push, then the big pig gets four and the small pig gets two. Uh, if the big pig doesn't push and the small pig does, then the big pig gets six and the small pig gets minus one, I guess, because the big pig eats everything. All right, because it's at the other end of the trough. Uh, if the big pig pushes and the small pig doesn't, then uh, the big pig gets two and the little pig gets three. And if they both don't push, then they both get zero because then there's no food dispensed. All right, so how do we figure this out? Well, first of all, we want to think about, okay, well, are there uh, dominant strategies, right? And what we can see is that um, pushing for uh, the big pig. So if the big pig pushes and the little pig doesn't push, then we're comparing four and six and two and zero. And so that's not a dominant strategy, right? Four is less than six, but two uh, is greater than zero. So the big pig doesn't right away have any dominant strategies. Uh, for the small pig, right? If the small pig um, pushes, uh, if the big pig pushes, excuse me, and the small pig is uh, then going to choose between two and three, not pushing is um, the dominant, is this better strategy. And if the big pig doesn't push, then they're choosing between minus one uh, and zero. And so not pushing is always the um, dominant strategy for the small pig. Uh, and so we can cross out that the small pig is going to push, right? The small pig is not going to push because it's always better for the small pig to not push. And so in that case, 
assuming that the pig can work this out. Pigs are supposed to be pretty smart. Uh, then the big pig is just choosing between whether to not push or push, and two is better than zero, right? And so now push becomes a dominant strategy for the big pig since we crossed out the small pig um, pushing. And so then we're en we end up with uh, the big pig pushing and the small pig not pushing as our Nash equilibrium. Now, that's not usually how I solve these, right? I talked about underlining. I'm just going to um, show you how I do it, right? So usually I, I say, okay, I'm the big pig. I'm player one. If the small pig pushes, I'm choosing between pushing and not pushing. I don't want to push, so I put an underline there. If the small pig doesn't push, then I'm choosing between two and zero. Two is better than zero, so I put an underline there. Now, this is just the best response for the big pig, depending on what the small pig does. It doesn't tell us the equilibrium yet. So now we have to be the small pig and we have to say, okay, well, if the big pig pushes, I'm choosing between pushing where I get two or not pushing where I get three. Three is better than two, so I put an underline there. Uh, if the big pig doesn't push, then I'm choosing between minus one and zero. Zero is better than minus one, and so I put an underline there. And now what we can see is that the only strategy uh, that, you know, is a mutual best response is push and not push. And that's what we found with our iterated dominant equilibrium. But I think this way is just a lot easier. It's the way I was taught in school. Um, and that's what I would recommend. All right. So we'll talk about a Nash equilibrium a lot. We'll talk a little bit about a, a subgame perfect equilibrium. But really what we're talking about here is that they are mutual best response. My strategy is a best response to your strategy and your strategy is a best response to my strategy. And if that's the case, right, if we are in a mutual best response, then there's no incentive for either of us to deviate by themselves, right? And so... You know, I think that's the key piece that sometimes is a little bit confusing, right? Because when we go back to the prisoner's dilemma, right, we saw that confess, confess is our Nash equilibrium, but not confess, not confess is the social optimum. And so why isn't that the Nash equilibrium? Well, it's not the Nash equilibrium because neither of us has an incentive to deviate by ourselves, right? If we change from confess we make and and you and the other person doesn't right because we don't control that other person we end up with a worse outcome right it was 10 years in jail if we both confess but if you don't confess and i do confess um then it, or excuse me if i don't confess and you do confess right then i get 20 years in jail and you get nothing and so i don't want to switch from not confessing and so that's really the key of that national equilibrium is that there is a mutual best response and as we saw in the coordination game, right, in the first video, there may be more than one Nash equilibrium uh, in a game. Um, what John Nash showed, and one of the reasons he won, you know, the Nobel Prize in economics, was that there's always going to be an odd number of Nash equilibrium. Now, you might be wondering then, because in our coordination games, we said that there were two Nash equilibrium, and two is not an odd number. Um, that's when we include mixed strategy equilibrium. Right. And so we'll talk about mixed strategy, but that basically means is that you're um, randomizing to a certain extent your strategies, which, you know, if we just think about rock, paper, scissors, where, you know, you don't want to have the same as the other person. There's no pure strategy equilibrium in rock, paper, scissors. You can't always throw rock or always throw paper or always throw scissors. You have to mix it up. Right. And and so that would be a mixed strategy. And so if we include mixed strategies, there's always going to be an odd number of uh, equilibria. Oh, that's what I was saying. So uh, when we think about baseball, right, baseball is another place where we might find mixed strategies where the, the pitcher is trying to fool the batter. Um, and so if we think about throwing fastballs and curveballs as long as, you know, the batter doesn't know what's coming, right, then there's going to be some... Um, some interesting outcomes. And so we'll talk about both pure strategies um, and sometimes, you know, our equilibrium of interest in industrial organization will be pure strategies, 
Um, but sometimes it will be mixed strategies. And so we'll talk about mixed strategies a little more. Mixed strategies are a little bit harder to find because we have to find the um, likelihood uh, of each strategy. And that adds a little bit of math to the situation. All right, so we'll stop there. Uh, I've, there's two more videos in chapter three um, going over how to find uh, some more of those equilibria.